Hello and welcome to the Dustin and Eric Podcast Show brought to you by Mimosa Networks. Hi, I'm Dustin. I'm Eric. And today we're on episode number 11, which is our very first episode of the Installation Best Practices series. We'll discuss site planning, installation planning, and interference. Today we have special guests with us, Jeff Jones and Art Feldman. Thanks guys for joining us. Oh, it's good to be here. Thanks guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks guys. And so we're going to jump right into it today, today's main course, site planning, installation planning, and interference. So uh, let's get started. So I think that site planning is probably the most important part of setting up a wireless network. What do you guys think? Oh, I think so too. I, we see a lot of customers that uh, come into uh, chat where they try to uh, do the site planning while they're on chat. That doesn't really work. So I think really doing the footwork early on is uh, is going to ensure a success uh, long term. Absolutely. You, you want to plan ahead, right? You want to understand what you want to accomplish. You want to actually get a plan before you go out there and, and jump. All sure. your requirements, client exactly. size. Yeah, there's a lot Band of consideration. Yeah, yeah where, where the network is today, where it's going to be in a year or two years from now, you know, not only just planning for what you need right now, but really looking to grow your network over time. Sure, because your because your plans may change as, as your business grows. You, sure. Yeah. Things may uh, expand beyond your wildest dreams. Right. So uh, what I do when I'm site planning or what I did do when I was site planning is I'd look at Google Earth and I'd look for some areas that I wanted to cover, like towns or large subdivisions or whatever. And then I'd actually go out to those sites because Google Earth, our design tool, they don't really do much with foliage or uh, buildings. It only really takes into account terrain. So it's really hard to know exactly what you're dealing with. So go out and actually uh, do some site surveys from the tower or towers that you are potentially going to get uh, from places in town or the subdivision. Uh, it's nice to have a drone if uh, you can afford a drone to fly up in the air. You don't have to climb anything. Take a lot of good pictures and, and kind of plan from there. Look at the uh, Go to the client location, potential client locations, and look, see if they make sure they have a uh, line of sight. And you might you might uh, you might be after six or seven clients, and six are great, and that number seven's got no line of sight. So you might have to uh, kind of re-engineer something to take care of that. For example, yeah, I, was, I would say also too when you do uh, the planning phase is to not just focus on one location, but to consider uh, Plan B or Plan C because. There's a lot of variables that you have to take in consideration, whether it's uh, line of sight or even the RF environment at the location. So, you know, don't get uh, too much tunnel vision that this one site has to be the location. You know, the beauty of Wi-Fi is that you don't have to do environmental impact reports or uh, or anything like that. It, you know, if you need to relocate, uh, you don't you don't need to file FCC reporting uh, report or anything like that. So, um, you know. Keep in mind that there's multiple locations is very important to uh, have that into your planning phase. Look at this. Maybe look at the spectrum. Do, sweep the spectrum if you have that, or go to a Mimosa radio and look at your five or ten gig spectrum. See what it looks like. How busy is it? Yeah. So forth. Yeah. All, all good ideas. Contingency plan, site plan, actually going on site and actually seeing what the what the uh, uh, terrain looks like. Sure. I mean, because uh, things will pop up all the time and. Uh, uh, you, may, you may draw it out and plan everything ahead, but once you're actually on site, things may, uh, may you notice things that you didn't plan for. Yeah, then you need to uh, make sure that you you get you might not be able to get access to your your tower or your second third floor building, uh, you know, 24 seven. So you might have to uh, give the property owner uh, a heads up 24 hours in advance, and, and you got to consider some of these things for access to fix things or to build your system. Good point. Or, you know, you could be like somebody I used to know, and when they give you a key, you sneak off and go make a copy of it where you don't have to worry about uh, but, them being there or not. But we follow the rules. But, yeah, yeah, definitely follow the rules. You don't want to get kicked off a building or a tower or anything like that. Well, you know, if a network goes down, it's never going to go down during work hours. It's always going to be, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday or weekend. So uh, I like your idea about make sure that, you know, keep in mind that, you know, site access is really important because not only for repairs and emergencies and so forth, but also planned maintenance where you want to get into that 
uh, location and upgrade your network, you know, after hours. So that's really important. Yeah, sometimes you're going through uh, two gates, you know, and, and so forth. You're going up that yeah. winding road for an hour and 10 minutes, you know, or, or it's just not a building that you can knock on the Marriott Hotel and get access yep. from the, uh, the site engineer and go right up to the, you know, the rooftop. So another thing to consider is, you know, you've picked out a potential tower location, but do you actually have room on that tower to deploy uh, also, uh, the spectrum you guys talked about, uh, you, if you have a lot of antennas, or even if you don't have a lot of antennas, you still need to look at the spectrum before you decide on what you deploy. Uh, so the trees, the terrain, the, the spectrum, it depends. All factors depend on that because you don't know what you can deploy or what you can't deploy until you go out and actually look at that stuff because different yeah. frequencies work in different environments. Yeah, I think even the time of the year uh, is important because one of the things we see is that out in the Midwest where, the, you know, if you do a, a site survey in fall where there's no trees, no leaves on the trees there, I uh, wish there was no trees, but unfortunately <laughs> that's uh, part of nature. But having... Uh, until having, we get on Mars. Yeah, until we get on Mars. Line of sight will be superb. Yeah, that's that's looking forward to that. But, you know, also taking in mind where, where the location is and the, the year uh, time of year that you're out there is very important. Yeah. And unfortunately, you don't really have control over where you're going to where you where you're going to mount the uh, equipment. I mean, you can you can kind of decide where how high you can go. Or, mm -hmm. um, but if you have other if you have other antennas already on at that location, you really have you're limited to where you can actually mount the equipment. Well, there's uh, on the client side, there's there's aesthetics. Uh, you know, first we right. want to get a signal, and then we'll give maybe give you give you an option. How about A or B? We want to tuck it away. We want to hide this, make it look nice on the house. Uh, but we also need to get a, a signal. We have we have clients that actually will go out and uh, go out and actually trim the trees or work with their neighbors and, and take down part of the, the side of an oak tree a little bit, and that opens up that uh, you know that Fresnel shot to the AP side, for example. And speaking of and speaking uh, of aesthetics, yeah. didn't, you have, didn't yeah. you have customers actually ask you to paint the equipment so it so matches or we, it's we've done that. Down. We've ca yeah. we've kind of camoed that with say non metallics on different sizes, different size dishes. And on the ten gig dishes and uh, and some of the smaller yeah. smaller uh, client radios. Not always a good idea to paint over yeah. the dish, but yeah. yeah, it's a part of reality. Yeah. So talk. with installation planning, let's let's get a little bit of an opinion from all all three of you guys. So let's let's start with Eric. Eric, if you were doing installation planning, what would you start with? What would you do next, and what would you finish with? I mean, uh, uh, on installation. So it, am I on? The cl uh, client side? No, so we're, we're still talking out. about towers or rooftops. Oh, okay, I'm looking at uh, antenna placement um, and and co-location, etc. Et um, am I going to narrow have a, a narrow or a beam with a sector antenna so I could just focus the energy out to a, a, a swath of clients in the field? Uh, do I have an AP up uh, and and so forth? Uh, proximity. To other uh, RF generating uh, devices, et cetera, and so forth. That's part of what I would look at. Uh, Jeff, you did this stuff in another life. What would you do? What would you go through to to do this? Well, I think uh, clear line of sight is really important. We uh, see a number of customers where they don't really take that into mind, especially if there's any type of metal uh, near the antenna site location. Uh, we've seen issues where just having near field obstructions can cause issues. So, you know, again, you may not think that that metal roofing is going to matter, but, you know, that signal is taken, taken off at an at a angle from the antenna there. So you want to have a clear, clear view uh, with no Fresnel zone obstruction. So these are things, again, that need to be considered early on because uh, trying to manage it after the fact, uh, that can be a bit challenging. So one of the mitigating things there is you could, we can push the antenna assembly closer to, the, uh, say, a parapet or overhanging edge of uh, the perimeter of a rooftop. Sure. Um, if we need to tuck it away, we might be able to bring it back, but then, like you said, you gotta, you got to watch the, uh, the field and uh, make sure there's no obstruction of that, uh, that energy going out to the field. Absolutely. Right? So, Art, uh, what would you do for site planning and installation planning? Well, what I, process would you start? Sure. Well, Eric and Jeff had good points, but I think very importantly you should look at the uh, where's your power source? How long is my how, how long is my cable run? Because mm -hmm. you may you may have an idea. Hey, this is the best clear you know, clear line of sight, um, no obstruction. But hey, this is over 150 feet or 150 meters. 
So it's mm-hmm. beyond my uh, beyond limitation, which, which I can actually power the equipment. Or my you know uh, instead of instead of running a 110, I can I have to use my battery uh, battery pack to to power it up. So you're you're basically gonna be limited by your by power and uh, cable runs. Yep. Yeah. Right. So uh, what do you recommend our cable length to be then? Short as possible. Same as same as ground. Right. You always want the uh, shortest path. The ground and and the, and the uh, least least amount of cabling for power. Then we do what uh, up to 100 meters is what we recommend. We've pushed the the limits and still got the uh, gig, gig negotiation uh, and so on. But uh, every time you extend the cable, though, yeah. you're, 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 there's more variables you're adding to the there's, equation. There's some so. drop voltage drops, current requirements and stuff on those long uh, yeah. copper runs. Yep. Yeah, and there's there's things that you can do to mitigate uh, long cable runs. You know, you can always use a, a fiber media converter. Um, for towers that are longer than you know 100 meters, so there's things that you can do technically speaking to get around it. It's just that it gets a little more expensive the more right. the longer the distance. And I don't know um, what people's budgets are, but when you start dealing with fiber runs and uh, media um, media converters, uh, it can get a little pricey. So you know, t- to take the easy route, look for a, a shortest run possible. So basically, you're saying that tower height is uh, something you need to consider when you're you're going to actually deploy because if they put you if you find a 600 foot tower they put you up at like 500 feet you're already 200 feet over a normal ethernet run anyway so right. you're gonna have to get power and data up that tower somehow sure so you can't run an ethernet cable 500 feet and expect it to link up at a gig it's a, a mid-span uh, device etc right so other things to look at as well. So definitely good points there. And then, of course, our, our major inter- enemy interference, we've already talked about a little bit, but luckily uh, the Mimosa devices have a, a built-in spectrum analyzer that's pretty decent. Uh, you go out and spend a ten, twenty thousand $20,000 for a, a fancy spectrum uh, analyzer device as well mm-hmm. that does more than just 5 gig uh, or 11 gig or 24 gig, depending on the Mimosa radio you have. Um, would you recommend that people have a device like that, something that isn't just a Mimosa radio for spectrum analysis? Yeah, I, I would. If you can afford it, it's it's the way to go because not only are you looking for uh, you know adjacent channel interference, but you're also looking for harmonics. So you, you may have a transmitter that's outside of the 5 gigahertz, but the second and third harmonics is falling within your spectrum that you're trying to operate in. Also, too, we see a fair amount of issues with DFS, so you want to... Uh, know what your environment is around that location and uh, having a spectrum analyzer is the way to go but again it's pretty pricey average spectrum analyzer can be you know ten to twenty thousand dollars so uh, some folks uh, elect not to use those for the very reason it's just cost prohibitive d- d- depend on options and now we can get small small units that'll go to the laptop driven right right plus the uh, if you adjust the the bandwidth and, and the sweep rates on these things the uh, and, and so on, you'll get instant, instantaneous. We can look at bandwidths of signals that pop up, or we can capture this stuff. We can see patterns, uh, how frequent, how frequent, uh, what's the frequency of, of a blip on the screen? Sure. Uh, how wide is that? Does it stay there 24 hours a day? Does it does it come up and down? With the, and, Eric, great, somewhere. great point, Eric. Yeah. Because what you mentioned the, the sweep, and so you can use our no spectrum time. analyzer, yeah. and it's it's a good tool. But the the the, the times it samples yeah. the environment. It's probably going to be limited to uh, in, in relation to a more qual or a, a more expensive or quality analyzer. Where we can actually adjust the amount of times it actually sweeps and uh, samples the environment. So you right. can just, so certain things you can you pick up here, um, but you may pick up a lot more interference, a lot more energy um, mm-hmm. using a, using a different type of. Uh, Analyzer. Real time uh, capturing and, and so on. All right, guys. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, end this podcast. Uh, this is part one. Uh, stick around for part two where we'll go in a little more in depth on harmonics, DFS, and uh, a few other topics. So we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Art. See you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe or follow button to stay up to date with our latest podcast, which will be available on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud.